welcome back to the Pro Series Podcast. This is episode 110, and today's guest, her name is Joanne. She is one of the founders for a company called Sloped. It's a certified company that connects SketchUp pros with professionals around the world that need more help in the rendering market for SketchUp and layout. Um, she's also a founder of a digital scale roller. If those who don't know, it's those rollers that are three-sided, um, but she made it in a digital form. So it makes a guessing, takes out all that guessing out. But before we get into this episode, please like, subscribe, and review the Pro Series Podcast on wherever you listen to podcasts. And now I hope you enjoy episode 110 with Joanne from Sloped. Joanne, thank you so much for hopping on the Pro Series Podcast today and taking time out of your day to talk about a couple fun things and then your business and how you got into it. Well, super happy to be here and I'm excited to answer your questions. Maybe ask you some questions too. Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love to start the episodes out on how we kind of got connected and I love the way we got connected because uh, you reached out to me to talk about this awesome product that you um, or actually it's the website you have in your company you have, but also off camera, we kind of talked about another product that you do have. That's very interesting to designers. So I can't wait to talk about that, but let's jump in and start and talk about how it all started, um, into your design career. <laughs> Did you go to interior design school growing up? Were you always into design? How'd that all start for you? Hmm. Okay. Full biography. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was one of those kids that's like rearranging their rooms all the time and like painting their walls, like painting murals on my walls. Luckily, my parents were, they didn't care. So I just got to have free reign. Um, but yeah, I did when I applied, I went to Sheridan College in Toronto. Well, it's just outside of Toronto. And I applied for the arts and crafts program, which is like furniture making and, and glassware and glass blowing and mm -hmm. ceramics. Um, it was either between that or interior design. But I've always like I've struggled because I'm a really technical person and I'm really creative too. So it's like I think that's what a lot of interior designers yeah. face, where it's it's a good way to merge the two. Because for me, one of the routes could have been architecture, but my dad was like, "You're going to be way too bored." I was like, "Well, that's harsh." I thought it was creative, but anyways, I think he was right. I think I like you know even now when I'm going around, like I do notice the interiors and I just want to go inside the places. I think it's great when they're beautiful on the outside but for me it's really about where you're spending yeah. your time so anyways I went to Sheridan College in Oakville just outside of Toronto and then I went started to work in Toronto pretty much right away and I I worked for like interior design firms and I did have some diversions like I went for a sustainable construction and design course okay. at some point where we built straw bale house and I got a lot of like construction experience so I was kind of a weird detour but then i got back to interior design then i worked at high-end residential companies for about eight years and then and then i think like just like yourself there's some people that are just born to be entrepreneurs and they cannot be like held down by mm -hmm. the man and they're just like do my own thing so and you also feel like you peak sometimes like i think some people can work at a company and feel like they're always learning things but i really felt like you know i've I've got what I came here to do. I feel like I can yeah. run the show myself. <laughs> yeah, overly confident thought because obviously when you get on your own, you're like, okay, there's a lot more to it than I realized. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is about like getting, generating business and a lot of stuff behind the scenes. But I love doing all of it. It's just a lot of it was new. And that's part of the excitement of having a new business is you like need to yeah. wear a million different hats. I'm kind of the same way <laughs> when uh, I wanted to do architecture and move to interior design. And my I don't know about you, but my favorite part about interior design is how technical it ca can be. Um, I feel like a lot of designers mm -hmm. or maybe the perception of people thinking what interior design is, and they don't understand like, how technical the job truly is. I mean, there are definitely designers out there that mm -hmm. don't do the technical stuff and they have people to do that. But that to me, that's, that's my favorite part. Custom millwork, custom, all of that stuff is mm -hmm. the detail to that is the fun part. Yeah. And I'm pretty much just like you where it's like, you know, like the reveals and the like in inset, whatever this and that materials. 
Um, and I love pouring over those details. But I think what happens, like, for example, I was at some dinner party and I ended up talking to this lady who had like a past career. And then she's like, and then I became an interior designer. And it's not that I don't question that she did. It's just that she came to it from a different mm -hmm. perspective. And I think, and then started like designing people's homes. So she never had like a drawing yeah. background. And she outsources any time drawings are needed. And for me, it was like, what do you mean when they're needed? They're always needed. You correct yeah. me? When, when is there ever a time where you don't need it? If I'm like placing a pillow anywhere, I'm like, you know, doing a drawing for it, making sure it fits. And <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a, a huge problem. Just I don't know if it's outside of our country, but in the U.S. is a huge problem. Just the perception of interior design is in general what people think it is you know people are just like oh i'm passionate about decorating my house i love interior design well that's not what all mm -hmm. interior design is um and it's totally fine to be an interior decorator mm -hmm. i don't it's not a diminishing thing because to me I, as an interior designer i can't really decorate that well <laughs> i i like to Very get big of you, other people <laughs> yeah i'm not i don't like like that and it's, it's just hard when you go to school for interior design and stuff and people think that's what you went to school for, you know, and it's, it's, it just diminishes what you kind of just accomplished. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's a matter of like, they got the semantics wrong in school early on, because in a lot of other places in the world, there's interior architecture and decorating, and there's a big distinction. But for some reason, it's just become like, melded and i understand why yeah. it is because one can easily flow into the other it's exactly. like architecture can easily flow into interior design um so yeah sometimes i will tell people that I'm, i do interior architecture and i can also do questions where i can explain what the difference is <clears throat> yeah it should have been done a long time ago it should have never been clumped together like that but again like i can see why it happened it's just you can't always know what the consequences are like how it'll extrapolate itself and how many people it'll piss off. <laughs> yeah. So how soon after school did you start um, into your own business or did you start working for a different company? 10 or 11 years, I would say, before I, I had a stint at one high-end company in Toronto okay. for about six years, which is where I got like the core of my, I would say like my hardcore interior design stuff where I was like really detailing things. I was working on high-end homes and just, yeah, it was just like a really intensive interior design um, <clears throat> education, I guess. Um, and then I worked at another place for about a year and it was kind of the same thing, yeah. it was a bit more decorating. Um, actually, that is to say the first place, they kind of separated mm -hmm. it where there was kind of the technical people and then there was the decorators. So obviously I was more in the technical thing. So I. I just, that it made it even more frustrating for me because people are like, oh, I love to decorate my home. Like, I don't even, like, I've never picked out a sofa. I've never, like, I never selected furniture or, like, fabrics or anything for, like, six years straight. And then, and then I went to this other company where they did do it all together. And they found it hard to understand, like, but how can you separate the two? And I was like, well, it's not great to separate the two, but it can work. <clears throat> Like, you know, you can make a furniture mm. plan and oh, put, yeah. like, the sizes of the furniture pieces. That makes sense. And then have someone else specify them. That works. It works a little better when you're kind of doing it at the same time. At least some people think that. I'm starting to think that a little more. But anyway, so that's neither here nor there. Anyway, so, yeah, about eight ex mm. years experience before. Eight, ten. Because, you know, some of it's, like, loosely design-related because I worked for a few architects starting out. But, yeah, about five years ago that um, I started my own thing. Okay. So how do you like it so far? I don't like having a boss. Yep. And you're in the right <laughs> business then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, the problem with having a boss is that you can't ever actually make a final decision. And I am a decision maker. And if someone's telling me you need to run it by this person and this person's not available, it's like, yeah, it's annoying. You know, impasses are the most frustrating thing. I'm like, I could get this done, but I keep being blocked. Yeah. And I hate that. So now I can just decision make away yeah so when did this <laughs> whole company sloped come about and how did it start out you do you have two other co-founders is that correct yes so this is this is i'll go a little back in time to just tell you the full story of how this came about so yeah 
Let's do um, it. Me, like myself and and almost every other interior designer is still using AutoCAD for drafting and and that is like mm -hmm. it does do 3D, but no one uses it for that. So no. most interior designers are still stuck in 2D and that's what I was doing. And I love AutoCAD. I used it for a long time. I've used it since high school. Um, but I really wanted to get into the 3D world when I was on my own. And so in my mind, I was like, well, Revit, that's the only option. And my partner, who's he works at a big uh, architecture firm in Toronto, and he was like, mm -hmm. I think Revit is maybe a little too, and like, you just don't need that much for what you're doing. And he said, like, maybe if you're doing like huge commercial projects and you need like a lot of BIM type stuff. But he's like, I think you could just do a SketchUp. And I was like, yeah, but SketchUp is just like, you're just like push pulling and things get messy and it's not like you can't like really make like construction documents with that and he's like i've seen some videos like maybe you should just look into it first and i was like okay i'll watch some videos i'll you know search some stuff and and i did and it turns out that sketchup is so much more than anyone realizes and that you in fact can do every single detail you like anything that you can think of you can do really they have a parent or they have a sister comp not company but a sister program called layout so basically you create everything in sketchup all your scenes everything that you want shown you put it into layout and there's just like again there's so many options you can just do anything and i create full construction sets using SketchUp layout and like your reaction is the, the typical one, the one that I would have had a few years ago too. It's like, what? You can... <laughs> and the problem that I, cause I'm like closely in with SketchUp now, we get to talk to like the, the presidents and CEOs and stuff. And, and what I've told them is like the biggest strength for SketchUp is that it's so intuitive and user friendly. You can just like pick it up like that. You're just push pulling all over the place. But the problem is that everyone gets to that beginner level and they think that's it and it's like everyone's like oh i know how to use sketchup but there's like there's you can be an expert in sketchup and it can it's just so much more <laughs> and people are just using it at, at a beginner level that's the problem um i had no idea hmm. that was my always my biggest issue with sketchup i mean you make the cool pretty pictures but what do you do with the construction document part of it thinking that it's like one of those programs like it's supposed to work the same way but it doesn't and i think that's what gets people stuff they're just like why can't i extend a line or like why can't i mirror the, you know they get stuck on like well i can do this in autocad why can't i do it here and it's it's not that i can't do it it just does mm -hmm. it a different way because we're now in three dimensions so it's like it's a whole different ball game so you just have to kind of relearn and once you do it's like i'm a sketchup obsessed person <laughs> um so what happened was I got really good at it and I was doing all mm -hmm. my construction docs yeah. in it and I was getting enough work that I was like, I need to find someone to hire, but I know it's going to be mm -hmm. hard because most people are not SketchUp experts. <clears throat> so I put out the word and like was looking specifically for people that had like SketchUp Pro or like advanced in SketchUp on their resumes. And I thought, you know, it's tricky. Like I can't just take their word on it because like when a SketchUp model is messed up, it's really messed yeah. up. Like if someone really doesn't know what they're doing, same thing with AutoCAD, but worse. Because <laughs> things yeah. get sticky. Like people can have a SketchUp model that's like the whole thing's connected, like every face, every line. And it's such a disaster. And that can just like ruin your entire model. So you really need someone who knows what they're doing to touch your model. Um, so anyways, I would get onto Zoom calls with people and say like, hey, just open up a model that you've been working on and just like, you know, do this, do that. And I would like within 10 seconds realize that they had no idea what they were doing and that they would mess up everything that I worked for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then of course I was reaching out to the SketchUp yeah. forums and I was like, does anyone like, is anyone having this problem? Where can I find SketchUp pros? And then I had a guy reach out to me who is now one of my co-founders. He was like, well, I've been talking to a few people about this. I'm having the same problem. He was a, a mill worker like who does who engineers shop drawings. And he was using SketchUp for all that too. And so exact same problem. He was having to hire people and he just he found that he was training people and like, isn't there somewhere I can go mm. that just has experts or like people that are at a certain base of knowledge? Uh, turns out there wasn't, and like some people are SketchUp Pro-ish, but having the combination of people who are pros in layout as well, which is the like how you take it into 2D, or like a presentation program, 
Um, people that have knowledge in both are okay. very rare. And so we then started an extremely niche company. <laughs> and we hope for it to be less and less niche because I think the secret of SketchUp will soon be out there and all interior designers will realize that it's, it's the way to go. Yeah, absolutely. So so what, what year did this company start, Sloped? I believe we started in 2000, 2021. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, we're about like two years in. That's awesome. It's going well. I mean, it like it's three people that never met each other that were only meeting online because it was a oh, COVID yeah, I didn't think about that, that we're starting this company together. And oh. so it was amazing like what we were doing, you know, from it was like the ultimate remote working and and being a digital nomads. And I mean we couldn't meet each other, it was all happening yeah. in COVID. Uh but at the same time, COVID was helping us so much because suddenly people were super comfortable with um like working with freelancers and working mm -hmm. remotely and like everyone was just doing zoom calls um so we ended up meeting like when covid was pretty much done or you know it's not technically still not done um but yeah we met at sketchup base camp which was in vancouver and it's kind of uh -huh. like the yearly convention and we we got a pretty sweet deal from SketchUp to have a sponsor booth there and then to do two, well, I guess altogether three seminars. Um, so that's when we like met the, the, the top dogs of SketchUp and, and made all our connections. That is so cool. That is so <laughs> interesting that you guys started a company and just meeting basically on a forum. That is so great. How do mm -hmm. you keep up with that? Cause I know I've, I've interviewed so many people that go into business with friends or maybe two people that work together and they try to make it or a family, but I've never heard of like three rant, like strangers going into business like that. How hard is that? Or how easy is that? What was your experience kind of, it's still to this day. How was that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny. I was having this chat with my mom this weekend because I was kind of like doing a little bit of like venting about some of the, the issues with it. And she's like, but you know, it's amazing. You guys like just didn't know each other and like you've made a company mm -hmm. and you've only really met once. I was like, I think the, the secret sauce is that <clears throat> like if I got onto a call with them the first time ever and I just didn't feel like we clicked at all, then it would have been over. Yeah. Somehow we were lucky enough that it actually was like five or six people at first and I felt like I didn't click with some of them. So some of those got weeded out and it came down to three of us and we all just really click. Like we all just, I don't know, have like similar enough personalities and like just gel. And so it makes it super easy. We don't have like a ton of conflict. We all, when there are conflicts, we resolve them really calmly and, and easily. They're, like they're both just two really nice guys and like really patient and calm. So, so it's been great. Like I think that if they were family or friends, it would have been a lot yeah harder so to me it's great it's like we're actually quite separate our lives are super separate so when we get off that call it's pretty the much cool it. part about it is <laughs> you guys bonded originally off of the issues that you were having to create the company uh -huh. and i think that's probably why you've become so successful because that was your original why you guys came together it's not like you had a personal relationship before or your friends or whatever it was bonding off of the mm -hmm. issue that what created the snowball of sloped and made it into the company that you are. That's a good observation because that is also our mission statement because, you know, anytime you have oh, okay. to make decisions in a company, it's like, everyone's got ideas. Everyone's telling us like, Oh, we should do this. We should do that. And then, you know, you kind of have to come back to like, why are we here? Why did we start this thing? And it's like this common problem. And, if someone's giving us advice like you should do this we think okay well what are we trying to solve again and does this help us solve it no okay well mm -hmm. let's not even consider it and basically the, the mission statement is like would it help our businesses as businesses would we use that as a service or would we do that no okay then it doesn't it shouldn't it's not going to work for our audience mm -hmm. then so you all three mm -hmm. of you still have your own That'll side work. design businesses <laughs> wow how difficult I is mean, that yeah. I work hourly with interior design, so it really helps in that, like, I know that if I just spend, like, a good two to three hours on billable hours every day, that's enough for me to make enough money in my day-to-day uh -huh. -day support my life.
And obviously there's a bunch of like unbillable hours that have to be worked at, but I generally dedicate like a third of my time to the sloped business. Some days a lot more, some days less, but on average about that much. And the idea is that it's like mostly hands off because we sort of created a system where we like it's there's two parts to it. We test and certify people. We have like an examination process to make sure that they're good at SketchUp and layout. And the other side mm -hmm. is we take on businesses as members. And and so when businesses who need help uh, reach out to us, we connect them with these freelancers. Usually it's businesses that use SketchUp and Layout in their own business and they need help. Sometimes it's people that actually okay. don't use SketchUp and Layout and they just want like 3D models and, and drafting. It's a good solution for them. Mm. Um, I forget where I was going with all that, but, but yeah, it, it's just a lot of work was what it comes down to. Uh, but, but worth it. Yeah, for sure. And I hope, yeah. like, I mean, it's like any new business, like if we don't see it growing exponentially and like, you know, we'll do a review in five years and see how it's doing, but, but so far it's growing a lot. And it's my opinion that again, the SketchUp secret will break at some point and yeah, and it'll become way more commonplace. And so that'll be a, a real kickoff point for us. Mm -hmm. Are you doing any like other trade shows like KBiz or any of that stuff where like a bunch of designers go to and do like a seminar? Cause I feel like, I mean, I'm part of NKBA and I go to KBiz every year and just hearing you guys and doing all that, where you have a bunch of your main audience at and hearing that would be awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear you said, cause I was thinking about going to one of those. We have the idea here yeah. in Toronto, the interior design show, and that's a pretty big one. So I was going gotcha. to start with that. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of it is just down to like how much time we have. And one of our founders now is in Dubai. Well, he's actually stuck in Dubai because he married someone in Turkey and, and he's like all over the place. The other one's in Utah. Um, so yeah, it's really a lot of the time down to me and am I going to go to the trade show? But I'm the interior designer, so that yeah. makes sense. But yeah, I feel like it's not such a luxurious thing to talk about the programs that mm -hmm. designers use, but at the same time, it's such an important thing in the day to day. Oh yeah. I mean, K biz last year, um, the SketchUp booth, it was packed. I mean, everybody wanted to, <laughs> yeah. Cause that's, that's their, like, the software that we use as a designer is your, that's your business. Like if oh. you didn't have that software, what, what are you doing? How are you designing? How are you showing your clients? So even though they wanted to see all the new products and new materials and stuff for their business, they wanted to see how to better their business and learn tips and tricks and stuff. Um, so that's a huge um, thing at KBiz, at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, maybe I'll see you there next year. <laughs> yeah, always reach out. I'm going to look it up. Yeah, yeah. If you have any other information, uh, want any other information, let just feel free to reach out. I'm on the board of our NKBA here in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. the local chapter. Um but yeah, that's awesome. Let's get into your, your, the last thing, your smart scale roller. You, we weren't going to talk about this, but you brought it up in our, <laughs> our call before we press record. And I think it's the coolest thing in the world. You know, we all have that scale roller. We, we learned to draft with, but you came up with this genius invention to kind of have another tool as a scale roller and it kind of has a digital screen and everything. Tell us about that and why you created it. Well, it all starts with a little story. When I worked at, um, shout out to Douglas Design Studio. That's where I worked at the time. And my okay. boss, um, I just had a bad habit of printing things out of scale. I just either didn't pay attention to it or had like the wrong one at the bottom. Cause to me, it didn't really matter. Like <laughs> I'm not that much of a hand drafter. Um, Anyway, so, and I was being rushed. Oh, absolutely nuts when I, uh, when I printed things out of scale, and I was like, wouldn't it be great if I, um, if I could just have like a thing, like on AutoCAD, you can like scale things. Like, you know, you take this line, turn it into 10 and that like, what if there was just a screen that did that and that screen became the ruler and just like, you know, in an instant, this like fully developed idea came to my head. I thought like, this is amazing. It must exist. So then of course, when I went back to my desk, I was like Googling the world and, and found absolutely nothing even 
remotely related. Yeah. And I was like, holy crap, how have I stumbled on this gold mine? Little did I know how hard it is to actually get a product into the market. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to be naive in the beginning because you would never do it if you knew. Oh, I bet. I'd probably still do it all over, but at least I would have my eyes open. Um, but anyways, I I um, I commissioned a company to make a, a prototype. And I thought it was going to be a fully functioning prototype, but turned out to be not fully functioning. It just looked like a thing that worked, which is like a whole other story of how I absolutely hate these people. Um, but I, but I used the, the non-functioning prototype mm -hmm. to do a Kickstarter video with, <clears throat> so I get enough funds to try to put it into okay. production to do what they didn't do. And the Kickstarter did really well. It was like on the first page of Arch Daily. It was in the like RBA, which is the, the, the British Royal, British, British, British Royal Institute. Of our sister. And anyways, it just did really well and sold like a bunch okay. of units then. And, you know, it's gung ho on making it. But then it's just like the people who told me they were going to do what they're going to do didn't. So huge delays. Yeah. So disappointing. And just like yeah, the fellow man and humankind. It's like people are just there to take your money. So it's hard to get someone who is honest. And, and ultimately, like, I hate to say it, but like, I couldn't do it in Canada. I couldn't do it in the States. China was the only place I could do it. So they're the ones that like really came through, um, which is why, you know, everything's manufactured there. It became very clear to me. Um, so yep. yeah, now I did the the first, the run of the first 50 um, last month, and I just put the order through for the first thousand. And a lot of those are actually already pre-purchased. So I'm going to sell the first thousand, use those funds to sell, do the next thousand. Anyways, that's a video podcast. So I guess I should like show it. Yeah, that is cool. That is so cool. So is it, are you going to have a website and everything for people to pre-order? Uh, yeah, the pre-order is on the Smart Scale Ruler website. So it's www.smartscaleruler.com. And there's a store there. And you just buy it that way. <laughs> I love how you made it just simple and just it just straightforward. Yeah, I mean it's a long one, but it is easy enough to remember. Oh, you mean yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like I don't even have to describe it. I mean, to people outside of the in the industry, I have to describe it, and they still don't know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> but, it's yeah, but as soon as someone hears that name, they're gonna know exactly what it does, yeah. pretty much, which is the best part because we all have that pain. Yeah, I mean, it turns out the market is actually like all over the place, like yeah. plumbers, pilots, hobbyists, it's just like anyone that deals with anything drawing related. In fact, sometimes even more so like, like say plumbers, for example, they sometimes they have to deal with drawings, but they don't use the computer yeah. themselves. And sometimes they need to look at like, you know, they print out like a spec for like a, like a rough in or something, but they don't know how much it measures. So for them, it's important because they can't just like take it into blue beam and, and like scale it, and measure it. Um, so. I, a business that I, I, I just thought about that would probably benefit mm -hmm. a lot from it is real estate agents from having the blueprints. And for the most part, they you usually don't know how mm -hmm. to use a scale roller because they're just not a lot of people that just have never mm -hmm. used one just don't know how to use it. Um, but that would benefit them crazily because they always have the blueprint on like the kitchen island or an open house and stuff and people are asking questions yeah that is actually a big one i did get quite a few orders from them too okay and i know they're going like all digital too but there's so many old school people still out there no. that like <laughs> yeah yeah in fact scary enough most people are still a bit old school yeah but also <laughs> with these older houses they're not digital. Those aren't plans. Yeah, it's yeah, true. They're just plans that they found in the basement or mm -hmm. in the attic. out, And they, they're not, there's no digital footprint on them for the township or anything as to how old they are. Yeah, exactly. So the need is there and, and it works super well. Like I'm really happy with it. Um, so you should, uh, maybe I'll send you one. Yeah. I, I would love to do like a little video or like a reel on social media about that. That'd be pretty cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'll send you one. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I'll let's work on that. And yeah, I'll, if you can spend a hundred units in one year, I'll send you. <laughs> well, I want to finish on where people could follow you if you have any social media for the sloped or um, scale roller or whatever, um, or your personal business. Um, 
And yeah, just give us your websites and all that. Uh, the Sloped website is sloped, S-L-O-P-E-D dot I-O. And we do have an Instagram. I think it's, yeah, it's sloped.official. Okay. And then SmartScale, the best place is just the uh, the website, smartscaleroller.com. Um, I also have an Instagram, but it's been inactive for like five years. So it'll, it'll get active again at some point. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Maybe um, hopefully when this yeah, podcast okay. comes out. Yeah. Well, you can tell Launch. me when it's scheduled after this. Yeah. Um, and then to your design, I doubt that other interior designers yeah. are looking for interior design service, but, but my last name is Swiss Dursky, which is Swiss Turkey. And that's the name of the website. Talk. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for hopping on the Pro Series podcast. Um, let's stay in touch. Hopefully, we can see each other at KBiz, and hopefully, I could show off um, your product on my on my page. Yeah, sounds awesome. Okay. Well, thanks. I've had a fun time, and we'll be in touch. Yes.